So again, I'm Josh Thorner, and I'm executive director of a nonprofit organization, or NGO, called the Participatory Budgeting Project. I'm here from New York. And I'll admit that I was not originally supposed to be the speaker here. Uh, City Council member Carlos Menchaca was supposed to be here, so I'm a substitute speaker. Hope you treat me kindly. Uh, but also, um, the fact that I'm presenting on this, I think, speaks to what is unique about this process as well. So I'm the only one also, I think, that does not work for the city. And participatory budgeting in New York City, or PBNYC, is also not a city program. So it's the biggest PB in North America, and it's not an official city program. And so I'll explain how that works. Uh, but it was initiated by nonprofit organizations together with city council members. Uh, but the mayor actually doesn't have uh, an official role in, in PB in New York, which is interesting and challenging, which I'll talk about. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a bit about how the process works. I want to show a short video as well, so you can see it in action and share some of the lessons that we've learned. But I think, again, to emphasize and to start with, what makes it most unique is that it's really a model of, of co-governance. So it's a collaboration between community organizations and city government, and in this case, the city council, to design the process together. And so I was one of the, uh, the, the founders of the process back in 2011 when we started it. And it was a few nonprofit organizations usually using mainly uh, money from private foundations to run the process, and then gradually increasing the involvement of the city and city council. And that's given it a very different flavor, I think, than some of the, the PB processes in elsewhere in Europe or in Latin America. And so, again, for my organization, so our role, we provide technical assistance for PB processes. So we work with cities, schools, universities, governments to help them run processes. We do training, we provide materials, we do consulting and coaching but we really try to have them run the process. So we're there to help them do it, to help them learn how to do it well, and then to step back and uh, to say the word that Lena has trouble with, and to institutionalize the process uh, so that it's run by the city over time and is really part of government. So the, the way that PB works in New York and, and in most places in North America is similar to elsewhere, but with some differences. So first, that we start by designing the process and actually do that in a participatory way. So the process is designed by the participants. We use a participatory design process where we set up a, a steering committee of community organizations, community leaders, government staff to write the rules for the process together. And like I was saying before, that you want to engage people as early as possible. So rather than us or city government saying, here's how it'll work, we start out with questions. Like, how do you want it to work? Who should be eligible to vote? When should the process happen? How should we engage people? And then we, through that, we build investment and support for the process by the community so that they are leading it alongside government. Like elsewhere, we then brainstorm ideas. We collect ideas from people online and in person. Uh, the other big difference is in developing proposals. There's a much bigger role for residents in developing proposals in PBMYC. So it's not just that you propose an idea online and then it's vetted or, or reviewed by technical experts and it goes on the ballot. Instead, you propose it online or in person. And then a committee of neighbors works on the idea. They meet with agency staff. They do research. They write it up the proposal. They then um, get it approved by the agencies and bring that to the ballot. So the ideas are developed by people in much more of a deliberative process. So there's more discussion, teamwork amongst residents to create the ideas. And then we have the vote, which I'll talk more about later, and we fund the winning projects. Uh, and so the New York City process, as I mentioned before, it's, it's not by the city government, it's by city council and actually by city council members. So there are 51 city council members in New York for different districts, and they each choose to opt into the process. So they can participate or not, kind of like in, in Paris, although we don't have matching funds from the mayor yet. It's a, an excellent idea. I hope that New York does that. Uh, so, so far, around 30 of the 51 council members have decided to participate. And in the past few years, we have support from the city council speaker, which is like the, the, the chair of city council. And she or he has additional staff. And so they are coordinating the process, 
but it's very small. Only like two staff centrally coordinate the process, and it's very decentralized, which I'll talk about more. Uh, so I'll show a video in a second, but I want to give a bit more background so you can also watch the video and look out for different things. So you can look out already for the role of community organizations or nonprofits. And then uh, I'll go through the other people who are involved. So on the, um, let me just open, put this all up. So as far as who decides, again, there's more people deciding in PBMYC than in most PB processes about deciding more things. So people in, in the districts propose ideas. Actually, anyone can propose an idea. You can all propose ideas if you want. If you visit New York and think that a park should be improved, you can propose an idea. And then what we call budget delegates develop the proposals. So they take the ideas, and there may be a committee of 10 delegates that has maybe 70 ideas about parks. And they're responsible for turning those ideas into projects for the ballot. And to, to narrow down that list, to see which of them are technically feasible, which of them are, have the, um, the biggest impact, and then bring those back for the vote. And then district residents vote on projects, and voter eligibility is more um, inclusive than typical elections. So now it's anyone who is 11 years old uh, or older. You don't have to be a um, registered to vote. You don't have to be a citizen. You don't have to be documented. All you have to do is to live in the district and you're able to vote. And then who runs the process? So there's a, a citywide committee of organizations and community leaders that designs the process and, and writes the rules each year. And the city council member offices participate in that. Uh, there's a lead community organization and then we're the lead technical assistance partner. And so that's the central uh, organization, and then each district has its own committee that that's coordinates its process, and there's a research team as well. The cycle is, is pretty similar to elsewhere. You have idea collection in the, the summer and fall, and then people develop proposals in uh, later in the fall, November to February. The vote is in March or April, and then implementation of projects takes a long time. Uh, as in, in Portugal, New York is a very, is a huge bureaucracy, and so it typically takes three, four, five years to do a capital project, uh, regardless of whether it's PB or not. So actually, I want to pause here and show a short video. And some of you have seen this video. It's a, it's a general PB video, but most of it is actually in New York City. Uh, if you've seen it before, you can look now for, for what makes, uh, for, for parts of the New York process, uh, for the role of community organizations and groups, the role that people play in developing proposals. All right, if you live in this community and you pay taxes, come out and vote, decide how your tax dollars get spent. Participatory budgeting gives people real power over real money to make the decisions that affect their lives. It's a democratic process in which ordinary community members directly decide how to spend part of the public budget. Oh, this is different because you're actually voting for where the money is going to be spent instead of allowing them to decide where to spend the money. Who knows better about their community than the people that live in their community? Do not be afraid of the big words, participatory budgeting. It sounds boring, but it's the opposite of that. So how does it work? First, people brainstorm ideas. They come together in meetings and assemblies and start to think of what kinds of projects they would like to see in their neighborhood. We had to think big. We have a million dollars that we could use, so we can fund parks, health issues, streets. Volunteers work with experts to turn people's initial ideas into full project proposals. We started with maybe about 40 projects, and so we had a series of budget delegate meetings, and we narrowed down the list into about four or five projects. We met with the Parks Department, and we talked about what we wanted to see change in some of the parks and how we were going to work with them. What are the real needs in the community? If you only have a certain amount of money, what is it that you can do that's going to benefit as many people as possible? I'm dreaming of new benches, modern benches. Seniors have no way to go. Displays at bus shelters throughout the district, and it will tell people when the next bus is due to arrive. We're asking for a projector and 30 Mac laptops. State of the art to fitness center. To put solar panels on a firehouse. 
After volunteers share the top projects, the community gets ready to vote. It's a way of validating every voice in our community and saying, you know what, whatever your position is, you live in our community, you have a right to decide. And that me as a representative and government should respond and should listen to that voice. Anybody could vote in this process, immigrants, whether you're documented or not, young people that normally don't get to vote. Most people, they don't even know that 16 year olds can come out here and vote today. Some of them are really surprised. They say, really? I said, yes. Yeah. They have a voice. The projects with the most votes get funded. The Red Hook Library Community Garden, what? right here. The projects are then implemented over the next few years. And the following year, the process starts again. People brainstorm new ideas, turn them into new projects, vote on them, and fund more improvements for their community. PB becomes part of the budget process. It becomes a new way of governing. I think this is like the greatest wave of democracy coming into the United States. It started in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 1989. From there, it spread all over Latin America to over 1,500 cities around the world. In Toronto, public housing tenants have decided how to spend millions of dollars on improvements to their buildings. City council members in Chicago, New York, and other cities have engaged thousands of residents in allocating discretionary funds. Entire cities have launched PB, such as in Vallejo, California, for funds from a sales tax, and in Boston for youth funds. Even schools and universities have used PB. This was a great opportunity for you to be a part of government and better the city you live in. Like, who wouldn't want to take advantage of that? You're creating a more educated platform of voters overall. So I think this can only be good for the big project of democracy. Yeah, I'll speak very briefly about um, uh, yeah, achievements, challenges. I can be quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, achievements, in addition to the number of people participating, all of that, three very quick things, I can talk more about them. One, scaling up and out. So universities and schools have also launched PB in New York, so we're doing it in more spaces. Um, deliberation, so there's more deliberative process in New York. Um, and the impact on voting, someone asked before if, there's a, if people vote more, if they participate in things like PB. We actually did research recently that showed that yes, so people who participate in PB are more likely to vote in other elections. So it, it increases voter participation. And then the challenge is, the biggest challenge has been decentralization and, and lack of staff support. So because it's run, in kind of, you have 30 different processes in different districts that are very loosely tied together. And so some of those processes are very good and others are not as good. And we don't have the level of staff support or investment. It's the flip side of having more of a role for community groups, so there's a greater role of community groups, and so the government steps back a bit and doesn't feel the need to support it as much, which is a challenge. Uh, I'll stop there. Well. <clears throat> thank you so much, and uh, thank you very much too, because it was a last minute sort of, of, uh, of invitation, but it makes sense in the sense, because simply it's one of the very few cases in large cities where it has been a really bottom up sort of approach by civil society, by Josh, and lots of activist movements, etc. And uh, it has gone to the district level, which is already absolutely impressive. And I would like to hear more, maybe at a later stage, how did you scale up? You started in one, and today you are in 30, which is absolutely amazing, with so meager resources. You know, how did you do that? That's still a mystery to me, uh, beyond your um, willingness to do it. So it's fair to have you here, maybe instead of the mayor of New York, you know, so just to, to make things simple. Mm -hmm.